Thanks for coming back, everybody. I hope you had a good weekend. As you know, we are moving our way through the last of the cycles here. Technically, we are finished now with Brayton cycles. Although, as we'll see today, our new topic, turbojets, are still related to Brayton cycles because at the center of a turbojet engine is a Brayton cycle. And we'll see that as we go through the topic today. But after this week, we'll have one new topic next Monday, and then we'll have three review lectures before the end of the class. So the end is near. And again, I'd like to sort of encourage everyone to think about problems that we could do or questions that you might want to ask during this review period, because I would like for that to be a lot more interactive than the last kind of review period we did where I just sort of presented some extra material. So last week, we uh, finished with or uh, sort of kept talking about this Brayton cycle. And if we think about our big three questions, right? So here, our first question is, what's the energy benefit and the energy cost? So this is a heat engine when we're talking about a Brayton cycle. So the benefit is net power or net work. And the energy cost is heat transfer in or heat rate in. That'll give us the thermal efficiency. We also talked about how in these Brayton cycles, it's important to remember that the power plant is the first sort of consumer of power from the power plant. So we have to look at the back work ratio, which is the power of the compressor divided by the power generated by the turbines. And here in a Brayton cycle, this is more direct because the compressor is mechanically connected on the same shaft to the turbine. So as the turbine is spinning, it is driving the compressor. And the remainder of the power goes out to an electrical generator so that we can put power out onto the grid. Like the Rankine cycle, we started off with kind of this sort of basic four component Brayton cycle so that we can understand generally how the system works. And that led us to this point where we could draw PV and TS diagrams. These diagrams are useful because they let us see that heat addition and heat rejection happen at constant pressure. These are horizontal lines on our PV diagram. And I've said multiple times, and I will continue to say, that any time you have a cycle where the working fluid is an ideal gas, it's very important to be able to identify the isentropic processes because for ideal gases, we have special relationships for these isentropic processes. And in a Brayton cycle, this happens when you're adding work in the compressor and when you're getting work out from the turbine. So when we, we can see that pretty clearly when we draw a TS diagram. Now, unlike the internal combustion engines, when we were talking about Brayton cycles, here, we, what we do is we start with this isentropic process, but then we could use something like the isentropic efficiency of a compressor or a turbine, and we would move away from these vertical lines to lines that move to the right, either as they're going up or going down. Because in those cases, entropy or specific entropy would be increasing. Because this cycle is a series of of open system processes, right? That's our second big question, right? Is the pro are the processes going to be modeled as open or closed? Now here we'll model the processes as open systems. So we have to use the open version of the first law and assumptions that we might make as we move through each of these components are that the system is at steady state, that it has one inlet or one outlet, that we could neglect kinetic or potential energy, that the process would be adiabatic meaning that we cancel out Q dot or passive, that we cancel out W dot, sometimes both if we're talking about a heat exchanger. We'll neglect any friction losses in the system. That's part of the reason that we can assume that heat addition and heat rejection happens at constant pressure. It's also the reason why we don't think about pressure drops between our different components. And we'll also neglect any heat losses that happen between components in our system. If we can make all these assumptions, we'll get the equations that we're used to getting where power terms are going to be m dot times h in minus h out, 
and heat transfer rate terms are going to be m dot times h out minus h in. We can use the first law to let us know which of these processes are positive and which are negative. But getting this far is nice because it demonstrates that we understand how to do the thermodynamic part of the process, right, or of the problem, but it's still important for us to get numerical answers. And to do that, we have to get numerical answers either for the individual enthalpies or for the difference in enthalpies. So that brings us to our third big question, which is what's the fluid? And in a Brayton cycle, the fluid is an ideal gas. So when we have ideal gases, we have to decide, is it going to be a variable specific heat solution or are we going to assume constant specific heat? If it's variable specific heat, we'll find individual specific enthalpies. And when we have isentropic processes, we'll use that the ratio of pressures is equal to the ratio of reduced pressures. If it's a cold air standard or constant specific heat problem, we'll never find the individual enthalpies. Instead, we'll model delta H as Cp times delta T. And for isentropic processes, we'll use an equation that has K in the exponent. Now, because these are open system processes where we'll typically know pressure ratios and not volume ratios, we'll use this isentropic relationship that relates the ratio of temperatures to the ratio of pressures. So this is how we solve our states. We also then talked about how do we improve efficiency in these Brayton cycles. And the first way we talked about this was adding regeneration. Now here in these regenerative cycles, what happens is we have some exhaust air that's relatively hot compared to the fluid that's coming out of our compressor. So we use this hot exhaust air to preheat this compressed air before it goes into the combustor. So this is nice because it reduces the amount of heat that we put into the cycle and it also decreases our exhaust temperature. Both of these things are advantageous. We also learned that when we're doing regeneration, we can find out how much regeneration happens by thinking about the regenerator efficiency. So here we compare the amount of heat that we would add if we didn't have a regenerator going from state two all the way to state three with the amount of heat we would add with the regenerator, which is only from X to three, because here we preheated the fluid from state two to state X. So here we have the actual amount of heat that we add. Now we can figure out the regenerator efficiency by taking the actual amount of heat that we added and dividing it by the maximum amount of heat that we could, or the minimum amount of heat that we could have added, or sort of the best case regenerator that we could think of, right? And the most that we can add, the most heat that we can add before we get to the combustor would be as if state two was heated up all the way to the same temperature as state four. That's the hot inlet into our regenerator. So here we can define the regenerator efficiency as being the heat that we added actually divided by the maximum amount of heat that we could have added if we went to the maximum temperature, which is the maximum enthalpy as well. We learned that when we do, uh, we can not only do regeneration, but we can do reheat, right? So reheat looks just like it did in the Rankine cycle. So here we split our turbines. So we have a high pressure turbine and a low pressure turbine. And in between, we reheat the working fluid. So we add heat so that we can um, add the enthalpy before we go into a second turbine, right? And we can draw this. And if we're drawing this on a TS diagram, it doesn't look too much different from our basic four component Brayton cycle, except now we have this reheat that happens at some intermediate pressure and then the second turbine. So we add this kind of bleb onto our TS diagram and here the area is increasing, which means our net work increases as well. We also talked about how doing these things together gives us some kind of a synergistic effect because adding reheat, if we're going down to the same pressure, means that our exhaust gas temperature will be higher, 
And because this exhaust gas temperature is higher, that lets us preheat the fluid a little bit more before it goes into our combustor. So combining reheat and regeneration gives us more efficiency than we might think if we thought about each process separately. Something that's different than what we saw in the Rankine cycle is that we can also split our compressors. So we have our stage one compressor. So this takes us from atmospheric pressure to some intermediate pressure. But because it's harder to increase the pressure of a gas compared to a liquid like we had in a Rankine cycle, what we do here is we cool the fluid down before we go into the second stage compressor. Here you can see this gives us a little bleb on the left hand side of our TS diagram. This is also increasing the net work, but it does so by reducing the amount of power that we're putting in to compress the fluid. So both of these things increase our net power. And that means in this case, that we get better thermal efficiency. So that's a sort of high level review of the Brayton cycle, which is pretty relevant for our next topic, which is turbojets. So the cool thing about a turbojet engine is that the center of a turbojet engine is a Brayton cycle. Here you can see you've got a turbine that's mechanically connected to a compressor, and in between, you're burning this fuel inside your turbojet engine and that's expanding over your turbine. So this is a Brayton cycle in between, but there's two pieces that we don't have in a Brayton cycle. So here for the air inlet, we have a diffuser and then at the air outlet, we have this nozzle. So if you remember what a diffuser does is it takes kinetic energy of a fluid and turns it into enthalpy. So a little bit, we can think of this diffuser almost like a compressor because what it's doing is it's increasing the enthalpy of the air before it gets to the compressor by changing kinetic energy into specific enthalpy. The nozzle we can think of almost like a turbine because what it's doing is it's trying to turn enthalpy into kinetic energy. What a turbine does is try to turn this mechanic. So it tries to turn enthalpy into mechanical work, right? So here in the nozzle, we're trying to turn enthalpy. So we're decreasing enthalpy, but we're doing it to try to increase kinetic energy. So before we start to talk about how we analyze these cycles, I think it's important to understand what we need to do in, able, in order to be able to fly. And if I ask my girls this, they'd tell me that what we need is faith, trust, and pixie dust, right? And that's great for, uh, you know, Disney movies, but it's not quite true if you're an engineer and you're thinking about the physics of this problem, right? So if you're thinking about physics, what happened was we designed this idea of a wing. And a wing has a specific profile. And the reason that a wing has a profile is that as air is moving or as the, the wing sort of cuts through the air, what happens is it develops a low pressure site or air with, or air with high pressure underneath the wing and air with low pressure above the wing. And what that does is it causes the pressure to push the wing up. And we call that force lift. So the profile of the wing creates high pressure ab below the wing and low pressure above the wing. And that gives us lift. But that only really works if air is flowing over the wing at a high rate of speed. So in order to get lift, we need thrust. Because we've got this big, huge airplane, and it's got to be moving through the air very quickly. right? And that's why the plane doesn't automatically start to fly when you're on the runway. right? You've got to build up enough speed so that you get enough lift to bring the air or the, the airplane up into the air, right? So what gives us the thrust, right? And the answer, at least sometimes, right? Sometimes you'll be on a turboprop plane, right? But if you're in a jet plane is you've got this turbojet engine mounted under the wing and it's providing the thrust. So what we're going to learn about is how we model these turbojet engines 
which give the airplane thrust. And because we have the thrust, the airplane is moving through the air, and that allows us to generate lift with the wing. So my girls were not quite right. We don't need faith, trust, and pixie dust. What we really need, the key part here, is thrust. Although a little faith in the uh, flight crew doesn't hurt either, right? So what is thrust? So thrust, the definition, thrust is a force, okay? And we get thrust force by looking at the change in momentum over time. So if you remember from maybe an undergraduate or high school physics class, momentum is mass times velocity. So we can develop equations for thrust, right? And if we separate these out, we can get mass over delta T, right? And mass over delta T as the limit goes to zero would be a mass flow rate. So if I take the mass flow rate at the exit or the outlet of my turbojet minus the, or the mass flow rate times the velocity at the outlet minus the mass flow rate at the inlet times the velocity at the inlet, I'll get my thrust force if my engine has one inlet and one outlet and the two mass flow rates are the same then i can replace this with just one mass flow rate instead of a separate mass flow rate at the inlet and the outlet and if that's true then my thrust force is going to be m dot times the velocity at two minus the velocity at one but why do we care about the thrust force so if we think about a heat engine right and the textbook doesn't talk about this so this equation is not going to be on the exam but we've been talking about these heat engines always in terms of thermal efficiency right and we talked about thermal efficiency as being the energy the desired energy effect divided by the energy cost and here the energy effect that we want is not net power so we're not trying to get net power here Instead, we're trying to get thrust power. So we're trying to get as much thrust out of the engine as we can, right? That's the benefit that we want is we want thrust so we can push the plane forward so that the wing works, right? And the plane stays up in the air. So we talked about thrust force, but how do I get thrust power? So we know that power is in kilowatts, right? Or watts, right? which are kilojoules per second. And a kilojoule is a kilonewton meter, right? So kilonewtons times meters gives us kilojoules. And still we're dividing by seconds. So this is a force times a velocity, right? Because force, that's kilonewtons, and meters per second is a velocity. So I have a thrust force. So if I take my thrust force and multiply that by the velocity of my jet, then I would get a thrust power. So my thrust force was the mass flow rate times V out minus V in multiplied by the velocity of the jet. Then I would get some kind of equation for thrust power. Now, when I think about the energy cost of this engine, it's that I'm burning jet fuel to add heat into the engine. So the energy cost is still the heat transfer rate in. So if I wanted to construct something that looked like a thermal efficiency, I would take thrust force divided by heat transfer rate in. And my equation would look something like this. Now, this is not something that you'll find in the textbook, and it's not uh, an equation that I'm going to ask you on the exam. So don't worry about that. But I did want to, to sort of give you the same frame of reference that we've talked about for all of these other heat engines. How do we define thermal efficiency? So for these particular engines, the energy benefit is this thrust power and the energy cost is still heat in because it's a heat engine. The tricky part, or one of the tricky parts, if you were doing this, um, you do have to think about the fact that typically in these problems, we need to think about this in terms of a moving frame of reference. So when we analyze these uh, turbojet engines, we're doing it as if we're standing on the wing of the plane. So even though typically the problems don't really say this, but typically we're thinking about this as if the air is still and the plane has some velocity. But if you're standing on the wing, it doesn't feel like the air is still 
it feels like the plane is still and the air is whipping at your face, right? So typically we'll do this kind of change in the frame of reference so that we're standing on the wing and air is um, sort of hurtling towards your face, right? So we'll take, so it feels like that air has kinetic energy, even though uh, maybe it's still in the actual, um, in the actual real case, right? Although, I mean, the air is never really still, right? But I think in the, typically in the homework problems that you'll read about, they'll talk about the jet having a velocity and they don't tell you what the air velocity is. So we think about, even though the problem will tell us like here that the jet has some velocity, the way that we'll sort of transform the problem is we'll pretend that we're some crazy person standing on the wing and the air is moving at us at the same velocity as the jet is moving because we're standing still and it feels like the air is uh, whipping into our face, right? And that means that there's some air with some velocity that's coming into the diffuser, right? So there's some kinetic energy that's important at the inlet of the diffuser. And hopefully, well, I guess the purpose of the diffuser here is to turn the kinetic energy in that air into enthalpy, right? So we try to harness that. That's why we put the diffuser at the, at the front of the engine. Now, remember, we said the purpose of this engine is to maximize thrust. So maximizing thrust means that we want to get our V out or our velocity at the exit here at state five. We want this to be as fast as it can be. So what we do is we put a nozzle on the back of the engine. Remember a nozzle, it's kind of like, you know, if you have a garden hose and you start covering up the area of the outlet, what happens is the, uh, the water, as it's coming out the, the hose, it speeds up, right? And it spurts out faster. So here, what we do, that's sort of the purpose of the nozzle here, is we constrict the flow, at least if it's subsonic, we constrict the flow, and that increases the velocity of the air as it's moving out. So here, we're trying to get as much velocity out as we can. Now, what that means is that we want to have as much enthalpy as we can in the fluid going into the nozzle. Because what the nozzle does is it converts enthalpy in the fluid into kinetic energy, right? which ultimately is the velocity of the air coming out. So we want to maximize the amount of enthalpy that goes into the nozzle. And the way that we try to do that is in the middle of the diffuser in the nozzle is a Brayton cycle, right? So it's this kind of basic, in this case, a three component Brayton cycle, right? So we have a compressor, a combustor, in a turbine. So I want you, I'm going to say something here and I'm, and it's really important. I'll probably repeat it many times in this lecture, but the important thing about the Brayton cycle here is that it's back work ratio is only one. So the back work ratio of the Brayton cycle part of the turbojet engine is one. And the reason for that is because we're not trying to maximize the net power generated by the Brayton cycle in the center of this engine. We're trying to maximize the enthalpy coming out of this Brayton cycle so that we can, in, we can maximize the velocity that comes out of the nozzle. And the way that we do that is we only bring down the enthalpy enough through the turbine so that we can run the compressor. So we're really just trying to break even as we go through the turbine. The turbine's only purpose is to run the compressor. <clears throat> and that means that the back work ratio, the power of the compressor, is equal to the power of the turbine, right? Even though the signs are opposite. So how do we solve this problem? The answer, as is usually the case in thermodynamics, is we're going to use the first law. And we have to use the first law on all of the different components. Now, you may remember when we started to talk about open systems, we did talk about how to do first laws on diffusers and nozzles. But it's tricky because kinetic energy here is important. The kind of heuristic here or the sort of um, assumption that we'll make is that the velocity is only important outside of the engine. So the velocity coming into the diffuser is important. And the velocity going out of the nozzle is important. 
But at all the other states, here I think they usually go, yeah, state one here, two, three, and four, we're going to say that the kinetic energy is not important as long as you're in or touching the Brayton cycle. So kinetic energy is important here at state A, the inlet to the diffuser, and here at state 5, the outlet of the nozzle. I think it's another thing too, just looking at the um, nomenclature they use here, I think they call this state A instead of state 1, just so that they can keep the state numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 the same as if we were doing a Brayton cycle. So that's why they have state A there instead of calling it state 1. So the kinetic energy is only important outside of our turbojet engine. Right? So the purpose of the diffuser is to try to turn the kinetic energy that we have at A into specific enthalpy at state 1. So what do we do in from a first law perspective? So when we're analyzing the diffuser, we assume that it's at steady state, that it's one inlet and one outlet, so the summation sign goes away. We're going to neglect the change in potential energy, which we usually do. We're going to say that it's both adiabatic and passive. And now we say that the kinetic energy is important at the inlet, but not at the outlet of the diffuser. So this velocity at the exit, which on the previous diagram was state 1, is going to go to 0. So kinetic energy is important, but only at the inlet of the diffuser. So what we're going to get here, if we're using metric units, is that the enthalpy at state 1 is going to be the enthalpy at the inlet state, A, plus this kinetic energy term from the inlet state. So what we did is we took the enthalpy that it had at the inlet and we converted all of this kinetic energy at the inlet into enthalpy at the outlet. Now, anytime kinetic energy or potential energy stick around in the first law, your spidey sense should start to tingle, right? Because this, the units are tough, even if we're talking about metric units. Because in here, if our velocity is in meters per second, and H we're looking up, say, in a table as kilojoules per kilogram, this is only joules per kilogram, so we'd have to divide by 1,000. So units are important in metric, but they're going to be even more important in imperial units because if we're using British units, right, then we don't, the equation changes, right? Because if we just took the velocity divided by 2, it's not that we wouldn't have the right units. We wouldn't even have the right quantity. So we have to divide by GC. Remember, that's um, sort of like a, you know, potential gravity here on Earth, right? At sea level. But the units are a little bit weird, right? So we got to remember the value of GC and the units of GC. So imperial units are weird. But even after we do this, right? So this would be in BTU per pound's mass but this would be in foot pounds per pound for per pound mass so then we'd have to convert uh, we'd have to convert this from foot pounds per pound mass into BTU per pound mass so it's always tricky when we're doing uh turbojet problems cuz kinetic energy is important it's especially tricky if we're using imperial units because we have this unit conversion thing that we got to worry about right so the units here are always going to be important but they're uh, i guess doubly tricky if we're using uh, the British system. All right, so how do we solve this problem, right? So we did hit the diffuser, and now we're kind of, you know, maybe we feel a little bit better about this because we've been doing Brayton cycles, right? So now we've got this compressor, the combustor, and the turbine. So this we're going to do just like we would do a normal Brayton cycle, except for one thing, right? So in a normal Brayton cycle, the pressure at the inlet is equal to the pressure at the outlet because they're both touching the atmosphere. But that's not true in this case. right? So we're going to have to have a way that we can fix state 4. And the way that we fix state 4 is that we use the idea that the back work ratio is equal to 1. So what this really means is, remember in the Brayton cycles that we've done, the compressor pressure ratio, right? so the difference in pressure from 1 to 2, was the same as 3 to 4, right? We're just going in the opposite direction because 1 and 4 were both touching the outside air. They were both touching the atmosphere, but that's not true in a turbojet engine because here we're touching 
not the outside air, but the inlet to the nozzle. So the pressure here at four will not be the same pressure at one. So the way that we end up solving this Brayton cycle is we remember that the back work ratio is equal to one. So if you get stuck on a turbojet problem, one of the things you might get stuck on is how to uh, get the units for the kinetic energy. The other sort of major or common stumbling place is how do I solve that state four? And the way that you do that is you set the back work ratio equal to one or that the magnitude of the turbine power is equal to the magnitude of the compressor power. So for all of these processes inside the Brayton cycle, we'll say that the system's acting at steady state, that there's one inlet and one outlet. Because we're inside the engine now, so the kinetic energy doesn't matter at any of these states, nor does the change in potential energy, we'll say that each one of these components is either adiabatic or passive. So it's adiabatic if we're talking about a compressor or a turbine, and it's passive if we're talking about the combustor. We'll neglect friction losses inside the engine and heat losses inside the engine. And when we do that, we'll get expressions that we're used to. We'll get turbine power and uh, compressor power, our m dot times h in minus h out. And we'll let the first law tell us what the signs are. And we'll see that the combustor, the heat rate is m dot times h out minus h in. And we're adding heat here. So it's a positive value for q dot. So this looks like what we usually know. But like I said, we'll typically not have enough information to fix state four. So in order to fix state four, we'll have to say that this compressor power is equal to the magnitude of the turbine power. Right? I've said that many times, so hopefully you'll remember it. Right? So the back work ratio here is one as we move through the cycle. So we know that m dot times h1 minus h2 that's our compressor power, is equal in magnitude but opposite in sign to the turbine power. So that equals negative m dot times h3 minus h4. And here there's the same mass flow rate because I didn't split the mass anywhere. It's not like a Rankine regeneration cycle. And then I can see that delta h across the compressor is equal to delta h across the turbine. And typically, the thing that I won't know is the enthalpy at the exit of the turbine. So I typically would use this backward ratio is equal to one in order to find H4. So now we're almost all the way through here. The thing that we don't know how to do is figure out the enthalpy or how we change the enthalpy at state four into kinetic energy at state five. Because remember at state four, we're assuming the kinetic energy here is negligible. But the whole purpose of this turbojet engine is to get velocity in the air coming out the back of the engine so we've got to turn enthalpy at state four into kinetic energy at state five now we can't do this um we can't zero out the enthalpy so we got to figure out how much of the enthalpy at four gets turned into kinetic energy and how much enthalpy is left over at state five so we're trying to maximize the velocity out but we can't turn h5 into zero Right? So how do we figure out what the kinetic energy is at the outlet of the nozzle? You guessed it. We're going to use the first law. Right Now the first law for nozzles, this is very similar to the first law for the diffuser, except we're going to neglect the kinetic energy here at the inlet because that's the side that's touching the engine. Right, And it's the outlet, the stuff that's touching the environment, where the kinetic energy matters. So here we're going to say that it's at steady state, that it's one inlet and one outlet, that we're going to neglect the change in potential energy. We're going to say it's adiabatic and passive. And we're going to neglect the kinetic energy at the inlet of the nozzle. Obviously, this air has some velocity, but we're going to say that, that it's essentially zero, that it's small compared to the rest of the terms in our equation. So now, we'll typically be trying to solve for the velocity at the exit of the nozzle. And here we've got this kinetic energy term is equal to the enthalpy at the inlet minus the enthalpy at the outlet. So typically, we'll, we'll maybe we'll get some information here about the temperature of the uh, of the air as it leaves the engine, and then we'll be able to fix that uh, that state so we can find delta H across the nozzle. Now, again, we're going to run into this problem when we talk about imperial units because. We can't just say 
the exit squared over 2 when we talk about imperial units. It's got to, to get even the right quantity, we got to divide by GC, and then we'll get foot pounds per pound mass. But we don't want foot pounds per pound mass, we want BTU per pound mass because that's what delta H is going to give us. Just like in metric, we don't want, this will give us joules per kilogram, but we want kilojoules per kilogram because that's what's uh, what we're going to get delta H as when we look it up in the textbook. Right? So here, we'll probably end up dividing by 1,000, although I don't put that in the equation because maybe you're given the, um, the jet speed in terms of kilometers per hour or something. Right? So here, if it was meters per second, then you would divide this by 1,000. Right? And if this was in feet per second, then you would end up dividing this term by 778 to go from foot pounds to BTU. Right? So it's always tricky with units when we talk about this kinetic energy term, but it's tricky twice when we're talking about imperial units because first you've got to remember divide by GC, and then you've got to remember to divide by 778, or at least to convert the units because your velocity might not always be in feet per second. So when we talk about turbojets, at least if we're using the metric system, we've got the normal components that we would see inside a Brayton cycle with the normal equations, except that the compressor power is equal to the negative of the turbine power, and the turbine power is equal to the negative of the compressor power. But then also, because I've been color coding these, right, we also have these components that have to do with kinetic energy, right? So here we've got an expression for our diffuser where we're trying to get all of this energy that came in at the inlet and turn it into enthalpy at state one. Here this should, because uh, this is the diffuser, so this should be V1 is equal to zero, sorry for that, right? And in the nozzle, right, here we're going to say that the velocity in the state that touches the rest of the engine, which is V4, that's going to be equal to zero. So here, it looks like I just switched these around, but V1 is assumed to be zero, and V4 is also assumed to be zero. But we got to remember with these equations, because these kinetic energy terms are there, we've got to think about what the units are, right? So, you know, the hairs on your back and your neck should always be standing up when you're doing nozzles and diffusers, because you got to be careful when you're thinking about the units. Right, so units here are important. Our equations become subtly different when we're dealing with imperial units, right? Because what happens is we have to divide by GC when we have this kinetic energy term. And then even after we do that, we also have to make sure that our units are correct. So here, um, we again, we have to watch out for the units. So here we have this turbojet characterization. And now that we've gone through kind of step by step, we could figure out what the thermal efficiency of the turbojet engine is. Although you'll notice when you go through the problems, the textbook doesn't ask us for this because they don't have this equation in the textbook. So don't get too hung up on memorizing this. Um, and don't worry that it's not on the equation sheet because I'm not going to ask you this on the exam. But I just wanted to put it in the same context where we talked about um, sort of every other heat engine. So there's one more thing that we can do on a turbojet. So you wouldn't see this on a commercial airplane, but sometimes you need to be able to go faster, right? So if we talk about a normal turbojet engine, it would end here, right? This would be our nozzle. We would have air coming out the back of the engine and it would be going pretty fast, right? But if we want to use something called an afterburner, which is something you might see in a military aircraft, you might want to have the ability to have even faster air coming out the back of the jet. And the way that we do that is we increase the enthalpy of the fluid before it goes through the nozzle. And the way that we do that is we burn some more fuel, right? So we have another heating process here in our afterburner. So here you'd have some atomized fuel in here and some flame, right? So you're combusting the fuel your the air fuel mixture, you're making it um, hotter, which means that uh, it's got more enthalpy, and then you can turn that ent that excess enthalpy into more speed of the air or more of kinetic energy of the air as it goes out the nozzle. Right. So this is basically the same process, but we're kind of doing something that looks like reheat after the turbine. 
So what this does is it increases the enthalpy of the fluid before it gets to the nozzle, and that means that the nozzle can get it can it can extract more kinetic energy by uh, again decreasing that enthalpy. So by increasing the velocity at the exit of the nozzle, we're increasing our thrust power. So here, if we were drawing a TS diagram for a turbojet engine with an afterburner, it looks the same, right? So here we're going through the diffuser, then the compressor, then our combustor happens at constant pressure, then we go through our turbine, only enough so that we can run our compressor, right? The backward ratio is one, but now we add this heating process. And as we're adding this heating process, we're increasing the temperature of our air, even though it stays at the same pressure as it did at state four. But that gives us a higher temperature at five than four, which means that H5 is bigger than H4, which means that as we go through the nozzle, we can get more kinetic energy coming out the back of the jet. And that means we'll be able to go faster, right? So we'll have higher performance, um, which you wouldn't see on a commercial airline because it comes at the expense of uh, burning more fuel. But certainly in military applications, um, it can be more important to have that extra performance. Whereas, you know, if you're talking about commercial airline travel, you really, really want to be able to have very high efficiency because you're flying planes a lot and uh, the cost and the environmental impact are both reasonably high. So that concludes our lecture here on turbojet engines. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have uh, on this material or on sort of anything about uh, thermo and maybe our plans for the rest of the semester.